Welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers, by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Junglist. This week we're getting into the groove and slamming some fat beats. Rockstar Games and Timbaland have collaborated to make the music creation tool Beaterator. Jack Black stars as Eddie Riggs, the heavy metal roadie trying to save the world in Tim Schafer's Brutal Legend. We meet the Aussie gamer who's held on to his world record score longer than anyone else in the world, over a quarter of a century, no less. And in Backwards Compatible, we look at games that make you go stealth. But first, can you guess this rock and roll inspired game from the past? Jam it to the news desk badge. Flip it up one more time, John. With the, I don't know what I'm doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. Good game. Didn't see me there, did you? Activision has shut the doors on Shaba Games, the development studio it acquired back in 2002. The Shaba team were behind games like Spider-Man Web of Shadows, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, and Shrek Super Slam with 61 full-time employees and a 12-year history. This comes fresh off the back of Activision cutting back the staff at the newly acquired Seven Studios, who are hard at work on Scratch, the ultimate DJ. 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 Three high-profile developers from Bungie have moved on to start up Moonshot Games, a studio that will be dedicated to producing downloadable games. The Moonshot 3, Rob Stokes, Michelle Bastian and Damien Isla were all key players in producing the Halo series, handling lead mission design and AI programming duties. Is game playing going to evolve us into superhumans? The US-based Mind Research Network Group has done a three-month study into the effects on the brain of playing a lot of Tetris. Using MRI scanners, the research group found that adolescent Tetris players developed more grey matter, probably due to the game's demand on cognitive processes. The study will continue to determine whether the brain cortex reverts back to normal once you stop playing. An Aussie developed game has won the prestigious award for overall best independent game during the Game Developers Conference in China. Captain Forever, a top-down shooter where you upgrade your craft through scavenging parts from defeated enemies, was developed by Canberra-based developer Jared Woods, also known as Farbs. Finally, the online launch of FIFA 10 has not been a match-winning performance for Australian gamers. Despite promises we'd automatically be paired with players in our own region, this has not been the case. But here's a good game tip. In the online section, go into lounges and then lobbies and find your way to the Asia lobby. From here, you can see just how much lag you'll have against specific players. Good game. Rockstar's Beta Raider. Is it actually a game or just an editing tool? It's definitely not a game, Jung, and I think it's a bit weird that it's actually on the PSP because it's not really the right kind of platform for something like this. Well, it's here now and it's got the backing of superstar music producer Timbaland. So quit your hating, player! Just get on with it. Beaterator follows in the footsteps of older music making games like MTV Music Generator on the PS2, where you rearrange drum loops, synths, and guitar samples to create your own tune. If you don't already have a Mac with GarageBand or you can't play an instrument, then this will give you some idea of what it's like sitting in a studio and playing with a mixing desk. You can pan loops left and right, add effects like delay or flange, and chop and change how samples begin and end. The PSP certainly makes for a clunky interface as the D-pad switches individual controls while the analog nub switches which part of the interface you're controlling. Then you have to press the X button to actually alter the settings with the D-pad after that, and it's just too easy to make mistakes and get frustrated. Yeah, I found myself craving uh, you know, a stylus, and this could have worked on the DS, but I guess maybe there's not enough space for all the music. It would have really worked on something like the iTouch. If you're expecting any kind of music mini-games or rhythm-based challenges, this isn't for you. Beaterator is solely a music creation tool. A lot of Beaterator's appeal will come down to whether you like the handiwork of Timberland, as a lot of the loops were created by him. I don't know how much more of this I can take. They do range in genre though, from hip hop and drum and bass to pop, rock, house, and breakbeat. Yes, Timberland. Well, the majority of his samples are really slick, of course, but I did think some of them sounded like a Casio tone gone haywire or a bad nightclub after one too many mojitos. So I guess part of the challenge is making them sound even better with the right arrangement. 
It's a matter of personal taste, isn't it, Jung? There is the option to record your own samples if you want to get into the more advanced beta ratering, but I think this is where gamers with any musical talent will actually get the most out of this. Yeah, like the Korg DS10 emulator for the Nintendo DS, there will be a group of core gamers that jump on this and churn out some really impressive stuff. But for the casual gamer, you'll only get so far with the loop editing and mixing before you kind of run out of patience. I don't see why you'd want to fork out cash for this when the free browser-based version does pretty much the same thing. The PSP version does have a live play mode where you can cycle through eight sets of samples triggered by the buttons on the PSP. If you're outputting to a stereo, you can probably get a party started, but the loops are short and they get repetitive. <laughs> I'm mixing my beats on my PSP and it's, it's really going neat and we're at the party! You can download other users' creations from a site called the Rockstar Social Club, so there may well be a little Beta Raider community for you to hook into if loop mixing becomes your new bag. Personally, I found the surface level stuff about as interesting as mucking about with my 90s hi-fi stereo equalizer settings. Pump up the bass boost! Woo! And I know there's some amazing stuff that could be created with this, but I think the novelty will wear off unless you're willing to get into the hardcore end of waveform editing. I'm giving it six out of phase rubber chickens. Okay, it's definitely not a game. It's a full-on sample editor with a novelty front end. If you don't have any musical talent, you're probably better off with something like DJ Hero. But if you have more musical skill and knowledge, then you'll get more out of this game. If you want to emulate Timbaland, that is. I'm totally giving it 7 out of 10 Kanye West interrupting chickens. You should really see a doctor about that. Good game! <laughs> Didn't see me coming, did you? Just think about what games like Batman Arkham Asylum, Splinter Cell or Metal Gear Solid would be like if you removed the player's ability to sneak. It's inconceivable, right? And that's because stealth play has become a critical element to our games. In fact, stealth is even now a genre unto itself. But where did all this sneaky sneakiness begin? Hideo Kojima's original 8-bit Metal Gear for the MSX and NES is often credited as the first game to make avoiding conflict the aim. However, it was probably the original Castle Wolfenstein on the Apple II that originated the concept of evading entanglements. As a prisoner trying to escape a Nazi fortress, you had to navigate your way through rooms of patrolling guards armed only with a single pistol and your wits. Taking on the might of the Third Reich in a gunfight was definitely something that was best avoided. So the pressure was on to dodge patrols, pick locks to find useful gear, and even disguise yourself in Nazi uniform. Firing your pistol tended to attract a little too much unwanted attention. Not bad for a game that used only 4K of RAM, but back to Metal Gear. Solid Snake's debut mission to infiltrate Outer Heaven required the player to monitor the enemy's line of sight and exploit the blind spots. Snake could use a number of stealth assisting items, including binoculars, to let you scout out a screen ahead. And the classic cardboard box made its debut as the ultimate in camouflage wear. Huh? All clear. It was Metal Gear Solid on PlayStation that took stealth into 3D. The series has, of course, gone from strength to strength, inventing new ways for the player to get around undetected and fool those easily distracted guards. While Snake can always fall back on an AK-47 when things go pear-shaped, there was one stealth-centric game that made getting caught up in combat something to be truly feared. We've got an intruder right, right now, Thief. Quick! He's right over here! Thief the Dark Project on the PC is a classic example of masterful first-person stealth play in which remaining hidden is your number one priority. I have a simple job planned for this evening. Break into a guarded mansion, steal another fat nobleman's priceless trinket and leave quietly. As the wily thief Garrett, you had to take into account the environmental light, keeping one eye on a light meter to track how visible you were as you slipped through the shadows. 
Noisy floor surfaces also came into play, forcing the plane to be more observant of where they were treading and how fast they were moving. Who's there? Is someone there? If you were sloppy enough to be sprung, the guards would slice and dice you like sandwich ham. So the tension was, at times, excruciatingly good. Thief definitely helped to inspire a generation of stealth-tastic games. But hey, where would the genre be without ninjas? Tenchu Stealth Assassins was released for PlayStation around the same time as Thief at the PC. Missions involved lightning-fast assassinations, grappling your way across the rooftops, and employing diversionary tactics such as smoke bombs. The aim was to complete objectives completely unseen for greater rewards. Tenchu did suffer from technical flaws, a horrible draw distance for one, but it definitely made great strides for stealth gaming on console. The point at which Sneaky Tactics really took a stranglehold on the mainstream was probably the debut of Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell in the early noughties. Third echelon Sam Fisher had technology on his side when it came to covertly observing those around him to successfully execute his spy objectives. Once again, darkness was your ally. Fisher's night vision and thermal goggles made it easy to navigate through the blanket of blackness, so looking to manipulate the environment was key. As a good guy government agent, non-lethal takedowns were sometimes important, pressuring the player to think twice about resorting to messy machine gun fire. The art of avoidance has now well and truly made its mark on the gaming landscape, with stealth action offering players a genuine alternative to being a gun-toting boofhead. Good game! What do you get when you combine Tetris with Braid? Something not nearly as clever, but Lucidity, a new game from LucasArts, is built on an interesting idea. As little girl Sophie, your Nana's disappearance sets you on a platforming adventure. Except unlike most platform games, you can't jump. You can't even stop. To get your lemming-like little one through levels, you'll need to place platforming blocks to make it jump over gaps and also to avoid baddies. <laughs> There's a preview of your next piece in the top right hand corner and you can put one in the bank in your top left. It's harder than it looks and at first you'll have to fight that natural urge to just keep going higher and higher. The goal isn't just to get to the end, it's also to collect fireflies spread throughout each level and you'll get bonus content unlocked for every hundred. As so often happens with these games, the first time around you're just more concerned with getting through the level. Leave those fireflies for later, you tell yourself, and when the time comes for that second playthrough you think, Nah, it wasn't that good. Dying brings you back to the beginning of a level. There's no lives or game overs. And you can see the influence in the audio and visual side of things from Braid, and also in some of the text. But it wasn't long before I was skipping through it, John. You don't get the same piece every time, which introduces an element of luck that Firefly perfectionists will find frustrating. In Lucidity's best moments, you'll be planning two steps ahead and using quick reactions to grab those fireflies. In its worst moments, your screen will be a hopeless mess as you scramble around for the one piece that you need. It's a good idea, and I applaud the devs for trying it, which is the same team that brought us the Monkey Island remake, but it should have been taken further, both in concept and in length. It'll take you just a few hours. I'm giving it five and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Yeah, I think when all is said and done, this one you can miss. I'm giving it six and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Oh! Back off doors, not finished yet, because the granddaddy of virtual car collecting games, Gran Turismo, has gone portable on the PSP. Featuring a bunch of cars, 35 tracks, and the baffling absence of a career mode. Yeah, within minutes you'll have to come to terms with making your own campaign fun out of custom events like time trials, single races, and drifts. There's also only four cars on the road at any given time. The races can be fun, but they're cyborgs on a production line. They'll just plot along in formation until the race is over. They don't even know you're there. It's just not good enough, Chung. I mean, it, it's great that there's so many vehicles in this, and, and even though it's not the best looking racer on PSP by a long shot, there are 35 tracks and they are quite good, and you can tune all the cars, but, you know, I don't want to be flipping backwards and forwards in redundant menus to make my own game. That's your job. You're the game. 
Gran Turismo has a famous difficulty curve where those last few races are ridiculously hard to beat, and I really found myself just missing that progression and that learning curve here. Well, be fair, there are challenges you can work through. Yeah, but I mean, the first bunch of them uh, drive straight ahead for 200 meters and then brake. Fun. Let's look at the tutorial video, shall we? Learn acceleration and braking. Accelerate and come to a complete stop in the stopping area 100 meters ahead. Use signs indicating distance and other markers on the road to time where you apply full braking. Wow, now let's have a go. Start! If you're able to get through all of these challenges, then you're doing better than us. And this really is only for you if you enjoy collecting virtual cars and playing with all the tuning options. But it's not for me. Five out of ten rubber chickens. And what's with not letting me drive into the Grand Canyon? And where's the sound design on the car crashing sound effects? What is this, a marshmallow world made for marshmallow cars driven by marshmallow people? Yeah, I really didn't like the sound design, especially in the cockpit and bumper cam views. It just sounded like a lawnmower trying to mow impossible grass. The different camera options were great, but no online and no goals make the audience for this racer very small indeed, and we expected more from such a big franchise. I'm giving it five and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Doors, you may now close. G'day, I'm, I'm Rodney Day. I'm the world champion Pingo player. I started playing arcade games um, in the very late 70s. Uh, Space Invaders just hit uh, the Australian market. It was the biggest thing to hit. The markets in skateboarding and uh, rollerblades. That was when I was hooked. And I started playing Pingo in 82. Pingo is a strategy game. It's no different to anything else. It's um, it's based on a, on a Pac-Man design, where you've um, you've got to work through a maze and uh, and kill these little snow bees running around everywhere, and and do it within a limited amount of time. That's obviously where you achieve the highest scores. And that's the hardest part about it because they do catch up with you after a while. I was hooked once I first saw it, and uh, eventually it got to the point that I got drawn so much into it that uh, I end up playing it all day and, uh, and this particular day it was uh, very much an all day into the night event um, because um, you could only maximum scores around about 10 to 15,000 points per frame so if you can imagine how many frames you have to turn to get 1.1 million points. At the end of the day we had a world record score which I wasn't aware of back in 1983. It was just purely by luck that I found that the score had achieved such a, a high ranking. My friend had contacted me one day and said, have you ever Googled your name? And I said, no, I hadn't. So just with the challenge, I thought, well, I'll Google my name. And, um, and this particular website came up and there was actually a plaque placed on the website for this search for this world champion that no one had known where he'd vanished to. And this person's name was Rodney Day from Canberra. So I was actually blown away by that because, hey, I'm that person. After 26 years, um, 1983, 83 was a long time ago for me and I recall I was 18, 19 years of age. And to hold that world record for so long, it is, I suppose, a testament to the achievement because the game is still played today. And in the Guinness World Record books, the third highest ranked score actually occurred recently, I think it was only 2008. So to achieve it in 1983 and to have the score for so long, is a testament to how hard it was to achieve it back then. And I think that that's, uh, that's something that uh, I'm very, very proud of because it's something that, well, who's, who says they've got a world record hold, you know, and the longest world record. Good game.
Here it is. Okay. You sure you're ready for this? Because what I hold in my hand is not just gonna blow your mind. It's gonna blow your soul. Go ahead. Open it. Voiced by Jack Black and directed by legendary game designer Tim Schafer comes Brutal Legend, an open world RPG where everything has to be heavy and metal. You play as Eddie Riggs, the greatest roadie in the business who hates emo tween pop music. I can fix anything, except that. After an accident at a gig, you're sent into another world where you're armed with a mean axe yeah, yeah, yeah. and a powerful guitar. Ah! You'll fight a number of emo-loving villains, and upon meeting a group of fellow metal lovers, you'll set about to rid the world of demons and those who've succumbed to the sea of black tears. But you get the gist that his roadie knowledge is really what's going to come in handy and save the day. Let me guess. You guys are really great at hauling stuff. You hang out in the shadows. You only wear black. And you're really hard to see from far away. What? I don't... My friends, these are roadies. And they're here just in the nick of time. The first thing you notice about this game is just how well the cutscenes are directed and the comedy's spot on, you know? It's, it's uh, all about the eyes. Oh man, don't tell me I've been slaying hot girls this whole time. Yeah, it's eye comedy at its best. This game has a lot of style. Everything in it has to do with rock and roll in some way, from the enemies to the checkpoint markers. You can tell a lot of times going into creating the universe, and Tim Schafer's always been a big fan of heavy metal, so a lot of what you see in the game's inspired by album covers and classic metal music videos. There's lots of skulls, candles, hogs, giant metal spiders, and of course, heavy metal. You don't have to be a fan of the music to like the game, but it certainly helps. The soundtrack and the cast is pretty impressive, Jung. I must say, when Ozzy Osbourne popped up as my gear vendor, I, I was impressed. Well, it's about fucking time. Not bad. Looks like you figured out the instructions okay. You've got some demon flesh on your bumper. But Jung, the novelty wore off for me. You know, I think because the core gameplay is all about this minion management, I. I didn't really want to do that. I just wanted to kick butt with a giant axe. I didn't mind it so much. There are some exciting escape races in there. The bulk of the gameplay revolves around escort missions and stage battles. Escort missions aren't so bad, but the stage battles are an attempt at real-time strategy. <laughs> Capturing fan geysers allows you to spawn more minions and slowly push forward, eventually taking down the other stage. I have this giant axe and I want to kick butt with it and the game won't let me. It urges you to do all this minion management and use them to solve all your problems and then just spamming AoE because it's the easiest way to win. And to me, Jung, that wasn't fun. I can see what they're trying to do. They want you to be a badass rock hero with an army of minions, but they should have had better AI for the minions so they could take care of themselves a bit more. It does get easier to manage your army when you get rally flags and you get wings to move around the battlefield. Those druids at the temple. They must have poisoned their blades with demon venom. Well, remind me to send them a thank you note. I feel great. You can win these stage fights pretty easily if you just have a reasonable selection of ranged and close combat units. That is unless you're taking down a tower where you need to use stealth units. We couldn't test out the multiplayer, but it does appear to be based around these stage battles and holding resource points so you can actually get more units and eventually win. Definitely our fans now. I really thought I'd enjoy this more than I did, and I think it just comes down to the core gameplay not being what I wanted it to be. And, you know, the open world didn't really have much to interest me either. As good as it looks, you can really only do a few side missions and harass the wildlife. Tim Schafer games are known for their good storytelling and humor, but the ratio of Schafer gold to repetitive gameplay, it's a little too far on this side. Still, I think some people will look past that just to be in the world. I'm giving it seven and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. I've got some friends who are playing this game and they really love it. It just wasn't enough for me. I'm giving it six. Good game. 
So, did you unravel the mystery of this week's rockin' retro hit? It was Motorhead on the Amiga, in which he played as bass playing lead screamer Lemmy. Smashing your guitar over the heads of rappers and chugging beers made for some heavy metal memories with the Ace of Spades. Time's up for another week, Badge, but the show returns for more gaming goodness at the same time on the same channel next week. And we'll bring you our thoughts on Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. It's on the DS. The Forza franchise gets a third outing. And we talk to a veteran game developer who's trying to write the rulebook for game design. As usual, there's a ton of extra stuff on our website. Till next time, gamers. Junglist, out, Badger. That's me. I get to say that.